Good morning. I'm so glad you're here today. Uh, didn't John do a phenomenal job last Sunday? Yeah, just amazing, amazing message. I wish I had preached it. <laughs> it was great. Uh, this morning we're going to talk a little bit about why God seems to allow the innocent to suffer in our world. And uh, just before we get into that, uh, every Sunday you come in for the last few weeks, there's been an image of Jesus on the back wall of the lobby as, as you enter uh, into this space. And uh, most of you will remember that that image is made up largely of names that you provided, that you turned in, saying that you would like to see these people that you care about find a connection with Christ. And so my hope and prayer is that you continue to pray for them and be, continue to be sensitive to opportunities that God might give you to be able to share your own journey of faith. So uh, if you get things right, if you do things right, shouldn't you be able to avoid suffering? Doesn't that make sense? I mean, what would be the reason to try to be better and to get things right if we are still susceptible to suffering. And in our world, why does it seem like people who are innocent suffer? And why does it seem as though people who are guilty manage to get the exempt card on that? And, and then what does suffering look like? And of course, that's a really big bucket to, to start identifying. In our culture, I think uh, physical pain now, maybe it's uh, something of an injury or an accident or disease state that can cause a lot of suffering. Uh, emotional distress, just the weight and, and the uh, experience of anxiety, uh, loss and grief. Uh, that can be the loss in terms of a physical death. It can be the loss in other ways as well. Mental health, uh, relationships. Now, don't give any knowing glances right now. Put on your best poker faces that you have. But some people are, feel as though they're suffering because the relationship has ended, and some people feel they're suffering because it hasn't ended. Right? Um, injustice. Trauma. And the thing about trauma is we can experience trauma just by witnessing something horrible, or we can experience trauma by having something horrible done to us. And then addiction issues. And, and I wish I could tell you that like uh, suffering was the thing that, that held off in a person's life until they get to a certain age. Like when you become an adult, that's when you're kind of eligible to have to contend with suffering. But suffering doesn't know any age limits or restrictions at all. So students go through a lot of suffering. There, there's academic pressure. They, they feel both from their instructors and, and from their family members and internal. Uh, there's bullying that happens. Uh, I won't ask how many of you were bullied in school, but I was. Wasn't a pleasant experience. Being excluded, it's painful when you're isolated and left out. It's a form of suffering. Performance anxiety, because a lot of people put pressure on us and we put a lot of pressure on ourselves. Discrimination, unrealistic expectations, lack of support. These are all reasons for suffering. And our world has opinions about suffering. And by and large, our world thinks that suffering shouldn't exist. And even world religions have opinions about suffering. For example, if you come from a, a, a Hindu background, the idea of suffering in Hinduism is that it's karma. You're just, it's a form of justice. You are experiencing suffering because you did something, whether it's in this life or a previous life you shouldn't have done, and this is what comes to you, so stop complaining about it. And then if, you're, if you come from a Buddhist background, Buddhism uh, teaches that suffering is the result of desire because we want things, we desire things. And if we could kill our desire, if we could eliminate that, we wouldn't suffer anymore. You just wouldn't care. Nothing actually changes except your opinion about it. And so our world has lots of opinions about suffering, and world religions have lots of opinions about suffering, and Christianity seems to take suffering very seriously, very realistically, and it's a lot more complicated than we want it to be. We wish suffering was simple. So last week, 
John walks you through the religious trial of Jesus, and it ends with abuse. It's surprising. Religious people spit on Jesus. Religious people punch Jesus. Religious people slap Jesus and then told him to prophesy. Which one slapped you this time? I, I, I know there are a lot of people who believe that a lot of the suffering in the world is caused by religion. I actually don't believe that. I think suffering in the world is, is caused by humans. And religion doesn't prevent them from acting in those ways. It doesn't exempt us in ways that we would like. And, what, and if it makes you feel any better, in a few minutes we're going to find out what non-religious people did to contribute to the suffering of Jesus. But let's begin in, in verse 27 of chapter 27 of the Gospel of Matthew, and it says, Some of the governor's soldiers took Jesus to their headquarters and called out the entire regiment. They stripped him, put a scarlet robe on him. They wove thorn branches into a crown, put it on his head, placed a reed stick in his right hand as a scepter. Then they knelt before him in mockery and taunted, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit on him, and they grabbed the stick and struck him on the head with it. And when they were finally tired of mocking, that is such an astonishing statement. When they were finally tired of mocking, they took off the rope, put on his own clothes on him again, and they led him away to be crucified. I will tell you what surprises me about Matthew's telling of the crucifixion, and that is how little he focuses on the physical torture. If any of you have seen the movie The Passion, I mean, it's hard to watch. It's, it's hard to not avert your eyes because just the, the pure level of physical torture that's being displayed on a screen in a way that seems so realistic Humans have a hard time watching something like that. And Matthew doesn't focus so much. He doesn't say it didn't happen, but what he focuses on, it's interesting to me, is the words that the torturers used. So they stripped Jesus, they put a scarlet robe on him, which is a, a symbol of power, but of course they're not recognizing power, they're, they're mocking him, they're making fun of him. And they wove a, a, a crown out of thorn branches and they put that on his head and they put a reed stick in his hand and the soldiers are, are mocking, they're, they're dehumanizing, they're demeaning him, they're doing everything they can to make him feel less human. And, and out of all of this, you can just not only see the physical pain, but also the emotional pain. We serve a God who knows what it's like to be hurt by words. Just in case you think you're the only one. Uh, these soldiers are actually politically motivated. They hated Jewish people. I mean, it wasn't uncommon for them to have a condescending attitude towards any people group that they had conquered and occupied their territory, but there were certain freedom-fighting Jewish soldiers who had targeted and assassinated some of their comrades, and so this was an opportunity to pay a Jewish person back for what had been done to them. And they used this, it says, Hail, King of the Jews. It comes across as a little more formal to us, but, but the truth is, is it's, it's more like this in the original language. Hi there, King of the Jews. Th there's not a formality there. There's mockery even in that. And, and all of their actions, all of their words are intended to demean. Their joking winds up turning to violence. They hit him on the head with a stick. They, they spit on him. The, everything they can do to show contempt for him, they do. They want to humiliate him. The last word of Pilate's trial was crucify. The last word of the social, soldier's trial, it says the same thing. They led them out to be crucified. Uh, beginning in verse 32, it says, Along the way they came across a man named Simon, who was from Cyrene. And the soldiers forced him to carry Jesus' cross. And they went out to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. And the soldiers gave Jesus wine mixed with bitter gall. But when he tasted it, he refused to drink it. After they had nailed him to the cross, 
The soldiers gambled for his clothes by throwing dice. Then they sat around and kept guard as he hung there. A sign was fastened above Jesus' head announcing the charge against him. It read, this is Jesus, King of the Jews. Two revolutionaries were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. The people passing by shouted abuse, shaking their heads in mockery. Look at you now, they yelled at him. You said you were going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Well then, if you are the Son of God, save yourself and come down from the cross. The leading priest and teachers of religious law and elders also mocked him. He saved others, they scoffed, but he cannot save himself. So he is the king of Israel, is he? Let him come down from the cross right now, and we will believe in him. He trusted God, so, that, so let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. Even the revolutionaries who were crucified with him ridiculed him in the same way. We're introduced to a man named Simon, but it's not Simon Peter. No disciples of Jesus are present. None of them can volunteer to carry the heavy load of the cross. They're long gone. Simon is from Cyrene. It's a place and country in North Africa. And he's there to celebrate Passover. His religion is Judaism. This is not something that he wanted to do, but according to Roman law, if a Roman soldier required you to carry a burden, you had to carry it. And so Simon is selected, he's conscripted. And what he's carrying actually is the vertical beam of the cross, the, the, or the, the horizontal beam of the cross. The vertical beam already would have been on the site with a hole dug where the crucifixion is going to take place. And it tells us that the, the soldiers mixed wine with bitter gall and they offered it to Jesus. Now, actually what they're doing is, wine is, is, can, can reduce pain. In fact, it tells us in, in uh, Proverbs 31, in case you're interested, alcohol is for the dying. That there is a kind of kindness uh, uh, in, in helping reduce the pain of someone who's suffering and dying, right? But this is not exactly an act of kindness because what they do is they mix bitter gall into it. That even if Jesus is going to partake of something that might reduce his pain in some degree, he's going to have to pay a price for that as well. And Jesus actually didn't drink this cup. There was another cup that he was drinking. He didn't want to partake of anything that could compromise his words or his actions in the pursuit and the fulfillment of God's will. Now some people, actually there was a, a, a heretical group in early Christianity called the Gnostics, and some people actually think that, that Jesus wasn't feeling any pain. That because he's holy and because he's God, he, it's, it's like Superman, you, you shoot a bullet at his chest and it just bounces off. And that's not true. That, that's a complete misunderstanding of sin and its effects in our world. Sin actually numbs us to pain. As bad as pain is now, because of our own sin, it's more numbing than we realize. Jesus had none of that numbing effect in his life. And everything, physical, spiritual, and emotional, is far more devastating to him than any other person who ever lived. In the ancient world, everyone thought crucifixion was horrible. And it was an act of violence intended to send a message. Anybody who does this, this is what happens to them. They wanted it to be so horrifying that it would dissuade anybody from standing up to Rome. The religious and the political leaders thought that Jesus was someone who overreached and overstepped and miscalculated, that in some ways he was naive. He misunderstood scriptures and miscalculated his influence, and now this is the consequence and the price that he pays. And what they did is they placed the charge, the crime, the accusation against Jesus over his head on a plaque. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. And, and what's interesting to me is it's a statement that's intended to be a charge against Jesus and a mockery of Jesus, but in some ways it's also the gospel of Pilate. This is Jesus, the king. He doesn't realize he's declaring truth. 
One of the questions I have is how angry do you have to be to mock the dying and the suffering? What kind of rage have you to be in when you watch someone who's suffering and still pile even more on? And that's what they're all doing. We're, we're introduced to three groups of people here. The first is just the people who are passing by. What do they say? Look at you now. Look at you now. You said you would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. You said you were the son of God. If you're the son of God, save yourself. Come down from the cross. Then there's another group, the religious leaders. What do they say? He saved others, but he cannot save himself. King of Israel, are you? Come down from the cross. We will believe if you can escape the cross. He trusted God. Let God rescue him. And then we are introduced to the revolutionaries on either side of him who are being tried and crucified. And they ridiculed Jesus in the same way. We know from Luke's gospel that one of those men actually repent. Show your miraculous power come down off from the cross. That would have been a lesser miracle. It was a greater miracle to stay on the cross and to rise from the dead than to avoid suffering. It's a greater miracle to overcome suffering than it is to avoid it. So people, people want religious leaders and they want religions to tell us that we don't have to suffer. Do things this way. Believe these things and you can avoid suffering in your life. Nothing bad will ever happen to you. Everything will go just the way you want. Is that the message Jesus talked to with his followers? What I remember Jesus saying over and over and over again is, if you want to follow me, take up your cross. Pick it up. Follow me. I don't know if you picked up on it, but the bypasser said, if you're really the son of God, have you heard this before? We have very early in Matthew's gospel when Jesus is driven into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit to be tempted and the evil one comes to him on three occasions and says, if you're really the son of God, if you're really, these are different groups of people. They're different kinds of enemies, but there's an enemy behind all of the other enemies. And in our world, suffering makes people feel uncomfortable. I don't like to see people suffer. My tendency is to want to alleviate suffering. My tendency is to want to avoid suffering. My tendency when I see someone, it's just hard to watch. It's hard to stay and, and watch someone go through something and, and feel like you don't have any way to alleviate their suffering. And the thing is, is it's not just the pain. There's a set of questions that we start asking ourselves. There's a set of assumptions that we start processing. And we wonder, what did they do to deserve this? By the way, it doesn't have to be wondered by somebody else. When we're going through suffering, that's the question we ask of ourselves. What did I do to deserve this? Well, Pilate had a gospel. This is Jesus the king. The Sanhedrin also had a gospel. Did you catch it in their words? He saved others. They recognized that. They, they were mocking, but they said it. He's the king of Israel, and he trusted in God. Jesus' father was the center of his life, the absolute center. God's will is what Jesus is pursuing on the cross. His will, he had to set aside. So there are people who wonder, was Jesus wrong about scripture? What was the Messiah supposed to be like? Did he miscalculate the opposition that he would face? Was he wrong? So I want to give you some scriptures that was written a thousand years before the birth of Jesus by the second king of Israel and this comes from Psalm 22. And there are these songs, the lyrics of songs that were written in the Old Testament, and some of them have prophetic meaning. 
This was one of those songs. In fact, uh, next week we'll find Jesus quoting twice from this same song from the cross. But tw Psalm 22, 7, everyone who sees me mocks me. Did Jesus get the scripture wrong or is he fulfilling it? Verse 16, my enemies surround me like a pack of dogs. An evil gang closes in on me. They have pierced my hands and feet. Did Jesus get scripture wrong or is scripture being fulfilled? Verse 18, they divide my garments among them and throw dice for my clothing. Is Jesus getting something wrong or is scripture being fulfilled? Verse 7, everyone who sees me, everyone who sees me mocks me. Verse 8, is this the one who relies on the Lord? Then let the Lord save him. If the Lord loves him so much, let the Lord rescue him. Christianity teaches us that God is present with us in suffering. So you're probably sitting here wondering, I haven't seen anything but scripture up on the screen. Is this a pointless message? I saved all the points for the end. First point, not all suffering is deserved. In our world, there are accidents, there is evil, and there are people who suffer at the hands of others. Sometimes it's just being in the wrong place at the wrong time. And we experience genuine suffering. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. Secondly, suffering may separate us from some people, but not from God. There are some people who just can't stand to watch us suffer and they'll take a step back. It's not as though they don't love us. They just don't know what to do. And they certainly don't want to make anything worse. But God doesn't abandon us in our suffering. The words of Jesus in chapter 28 of, of Matthew, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. God doesn't tap out when the pain levels get high. When you can't look at anyone else, God still looks on you. When everyone else seems to be taking a step back, not knowing what to do or what to say, God is not afraid of the dark and he's not afraid of suffering and he's not afraid of pain and he is with us through every single millisecond of anything that we have to go through. Last point, good can come out of suffering. Good can come out of suffering. God can redeem whatever we put into his hands. The word redeem means to buy back. Our world wants to pay back. That's vengeance. God uses suffering to buy back, to make a difference in the situations and in the lives of individuals that we are in. Not pay back, buy back. And when we don't understand why, I've asked myself a why question a lot of times. And I've come to the conclusion, there are some things I will not know in this world, in this life. But when I don't understand why, I can still ask what? What do I notice God doing? What might God want me to do? Christianity is not about seeking suffering. It's not about escaping suffering. It's about facing suffering through the eyes of Jesus, who never abandons us. He never leaves us. And his grace is sufficient for us. 
Your grace is sufficient for me. Would you just say that out loud together with me? Your grace is sufficient for me. Let's all stand together this morning.